Ipswich Town go full on Grinch two days before Christmas and serve up a turkey a couple of days early. Welcome to the Blue Monday podcast. Hello and welcome to the Blue Monday podcast, following the fortunes of Ipswich Town since 2015. I'm Craig Fimbo, it's Christmas Eve, and with me are my little helpers, David Diamond and Joe Fares. Merry Christmas to you both, first and foremost. Um, how are things going in your relative households? Joe Fares, is it ramping up? Is the, are the excitement levels reaching uh, crescendo just yet? Yeah, not quite crescendo yet, but they are working towards it as we speak. I can I can feel the sort of decibel levels rising outside the room where I'm recording this. But sadly, I can't hide out in here all day long because I am tasked with cooking Christmas dinner tomorrow. I've already Ooh. got a gammon in the slow cooker ready for the <laughs> side event, and I've now got I've now got to get out there and sort my gravy and my sprout gratin out ready for oh, tomorrow. Oh, beautiful! Cover stuff in cheese, mate. Anything is edible, isn't it? Um, yeah, similar to yourself, I'm, I'm cooking. My, the, one of the downs, one of the many downsides of being married, married to a vegetarian is they don't oh. know how to cook meat particularly well. So yeah, rest your turkey for as long as it cooks. That's what Gordon Ramsay has been telling people. So there's a my tip for the day. Um, and David, how are things your side? You, you got, I suppose you got yeah. a. A grand, an excited grandchild, or are they? I have, too yeah, young yeah, to, yeah. Uh, we'll be seeing her, I think, briefly tomorrow. Then on Boxing Day, so that's that's kind of nice. If if um yeah, if it wasn't for I think little Rosie with uh, Christmas, would obviously my boys are much much older. Well, one's not left home now, so yeah, I can only imagine, or I can only yeah, just about recall the excitement levels of probably twenty years ago, maybe even twenty five years ago now. So I know what Joe's about to um about to face but no all good um yeah finish work nice and early on friday um having a nice day presents wrapped and then along came leads yeah well we'd, we'll briefly go uh, go across <laughs> go across that um five minutes or so i think we'll give that towards the end of the show um <laughs> but for, firstly we'll we'll talk about a bit of news i know the guys um in the pre quickly with regards to my my christmas dinner i have the the extra problem that my father-in-law is a leeds fan and um Oh. they came around to watch the game yesterday and I was getting stressed. And after the first goal, I just took myself up to my bedroom to watch the game <laughs> on my own. And I didn't, come down, I didn't come down until they'd left. So um, I now huff. have to sort of Love come down. Them. They're around for Christmas dinner. So I, ha I will have my tail between my legs as they turn up on um, tomorrow, sort of lunchtime ready for it. But I'll just ignore that. I hid in my room for two hours yesterday and just carry on with the day as normal. It, it'll be very reminiscent of the uh, the Paul McCartney Pipes of Peace video, won't it? There'll be like this meeting <laughs> across no man's land of, uh, the, well, not the Germans and the English, but yeah, the, the Ipswich and the Leeds across the, uh, yeah, in the mud. Um, yeah, so when you serve him up that extra bloody bit of uh, turkey, you can just say, oh, no, it's just a bit of cranberry sauce being left over there. <laughs> I'm interested um, in the sprout gratin. I need. I think we need to know that recipe, Joe, because sprouts to me are the devil's work, but sprout gratin sounds fantastic. Let's I'll forget about the football. Monday let's Telegram go, group. <laughs> let's just go on to Christmas recipes. Sod the football. Come on. Well, we're always looking to expand, aren't we? So, but, uh, so you know, we, we can add along with um, the Popmaster group. Yeah, we'll add a uh, Joe's Joe's Christmas Christmas fair. I was going to say that. <laughs> Right. Anyway, yeah. Let's talk about some. Let's talk about football for a little bit before we go back to Sprouts. Um, I said the guys spoke about it briefly on the on the pre match pod, but I say I won't need your um, your fellas uh, input as yet. There were a couple of bits of um, news dropping um, leading up to the weekend. One of which was uh, related to international call ups, um, and we'll also talk about the little bit of news that broke before the match. I think it was yesterday as well. Um, Massimo Luongo announced his international retirement, uh, which I think was a, a surprise to a few people uh, and a pleasant surprise maybe to um, Ipswich fans and the Ipswich management. Um, Joe, that was good news, I think, from from our perspective. Do, how do you see that um, helping us from from here on in? It was great news, isn't it? Because he's such an important player for us in that midfield. Him and Sam Morsi have formed a brilliant partnership and we've got games coming thick and fast over the next few weeks leading up to it and to lose a player of that well you, you just don't want to lose any of your regular starters for any reason do you and to lose him for potentially six championship games is massive that's 
over a quarter of what we got left this season, isn't it? The six games there, and it's already bad enough losing Cam Burgess, but to lose Mass would be severe as well. But I can I can see why he's retired. I haven't had a chance to listen to his town TV interview, but I guess they talk about cycles in international football, don't they? And I'm sure they're working towards the cycle to World Cup 2026, something which Cameron Burgess will be hoping to be starting for Australia in, where there's, I don't think there's any way Massimo Luongo is still going to be playing in three years or sort of two and a half years' time for the national team at the age he's at. If he's, he's only on a one-year deal here, I think he'd almost talked about heading back to Australia to retire previously when he left Middlesbrough or Sheffield Wednesday. So, yeah, I, I can see why he maybe is not, right for this cycle but it's obviously great for us that he hasn't gone yeah and then um yesterday Dave, there was a funny little bit of news broke that axel twanzabi is being called up to the uh the democratic republic of congo squad i think just in time for the african nations um cup your knowledge of the uh democratic republic of congo squad is how's their defensive depth looking oh, yeah, i'm sure they've it's got Toto Entiala available haven't they so so and so, I'm sure. Is it, was it, isn't it well-known thing, um, Dominic Republic Congo? Is that the most popular answer on Pointless, apparently? Anyway, um, I um, uh, yeah, that was a kind of a weird one. But then later on, I think it was named in like a 45-man squad, which is 10 less than the Egyptian original squad, wasn't it? <laughs> um, so, um, but that was kind of um, sort of almost shut down after the game by um, by McKenna, wasn't it? Saying he doesn't think there's... That's quite, it's quite odd, wasn't it? He sort of came out and said, although he'd been named, yeah. doesn't think that will happen. But I don't, he said they've, yeah. they've spoken about it this week, and uh, as things stand at the moment, it doesn't look like he'll be going. But it wasn't no. a total rule out of it, was it? No. But no, that did come sort of from left field somewhat, didn't it? But, well, it came uh, from me because so, so a Plymouth fan told me it, so I then messaged Phil about it for then four Oh, God. Kieran see, McKenna. See. Yeah. It's finger on the pulse of uh, finger on the Central finger African on the football. Pulse. One of my yeah Af- African sort of whisperers here for the Blue Monday podcast. We've got these guys <laughs> set up on all different continents. They're everywhere. Af- our African correspondent down in Plymouth. <laughs> did you say? <laughs> oh, but there you go. Uh, well, it's closer um, to Africa than here, isn't it? <laughs> well, yeah. So, so um, we again, you know, um, the squad depth and everything else that goes with it. We would hope that doesn't um, that doesn't transpire. Yeah, because it's interesting how how that potentially has knock on effects to what you do in January, isn't it? If you yeah, haven't had any inkling at all that the centre half that you've been dripping into your squad, I know, and this might this probably won't happen, but you know, just mm. as a knock on effect, full stop, you've probably been thinking, oh, Luongo, we're going to be missing Luongo, as Joe said, for a chunk of the time, or we might need to worry about finding a centre centre midfielder. Now you that has the need for that has maybe lessened a little bit, whereas now you think, oh, hang on a second, we might need to juggle things around and. We're potentially looking at Sarah. I, I wonder if he's even eligible for them as yet because he's played for England under 21s in competitive games, which means he would have had to file a switch to be eligible. So sometimes they'll call players up that aren't eligible and try and sort of force through the paperwork yeah, quickly it. and stuff. It wouldn't it wouldn't surprise me if he isn't even eligible and it doesn't go anywhere. And that's just and, uh, these lists are so long. If you think for the England World Cup squad, they put a 55 man list together and you look at if you think what extra players are going to be on that, I think someone like Adam Webster was on it for the World Cup, for example, where he's miles away from the team, but you have to have mm. named 55 initially. It's a, it's a huge number of players, isn't it? And again, further complicated by, well, potentially, um, Elkin Baggett off with Indonesia 1st of Jan, I think. Yeah. yeah so, yeah, we would hope there's nothing in that. Um and also, uh, another bit of news the guy spoke about and was broken was the, the potential of uh, current Birmingham Loney Jay Stansfield um, being on on our radar, as the as the saying goes. Um, it's sort of been bubbling under a little bit the name, hasn't it, uh, guys? Um, and obviously, the the performance that he put in against us was a half decent performance, a good goal, good little poacher's goal in in the box. He just always looks like a a lively. Um, pest of a of a player not wishing to um denigrate the work that he does but he looks like a bit of a jamie vardy pest of a of a center forward who can probably play all four um mm. of our forward positions um completely different um stature of um physicality to george hurst for example but um potentially adds a different dimension and takes a little bit of the workload um, off of George Hurst. So we don't know for sure whether this is anything going in it, but that's a name that was mentioned. TWTD and, and the East Anglian have reported the reports, if you like. Um, but Dave, that's 
Um, again, a, a gap that needs to be filled, and potentially mm. following yesterday's match, one of two gaps that needs to be filled. I think so. Yeah, uh, busy. I describe him busy yeah. around the box, isn't he? he? Scored yesterday. Watch the watch the highlights. He got no end of grief yesterday, as you would think from Plymouth with his um, obviously quite strong ex links with his time there on loan, and also um, his um, his father's um, his father being there. Um, he also had his shirt on underneath when he scored, which said "Once a red, always a red" on it. So, yes, which he showed yes, to their fans. Kind of, kind of incitement, but um, yeah, they say scored again. Yes, I think he might have had an assist as well. So, yeah, I, I, I quite like him, and I know I think I was you, Craig, wasn't it? I think you were championing him some weeks ago, or some months ago, and apparently, as this as this has broken, I think I saw on TWTD that. Um, uh, we made inquiry for him back in 22, perhaps, I think, or certainly, certainly earlier on in the piece. So, um, yeah, looks, uh, you know, looks a good player. Has, has proved he can sort of score goals at, at that level. So watch and, watch this space, I think. And I suppose, Joe, from our perspective, it's a sort of deal that we can do in January, isn't it? You see what I mean? From It's a loan. It's similar to what we did last, last season with, um, well, both... Bro- Broaded and Hurst to a certain extent. I and, know we and signed Harry Clark. And yeah, we signed them permanently, but they were recalled from an existing loan to to come to us. Um, yeah, so is that sort of it's probably the sort of top level of player that we could probably be looking at in January? Do you think? Yeah, and also you kind of want players who have at least been around a first team squad for the first half of the season, aren't you? That are maybe not fully match fit, but are close to being match fit, where he obviously is fully match fit, playing week in, week out for Birmingham. But yeah, you're, you're looking at sort of either players from the bottom end of this league, loans that can be repurposed or turn into permanents, or top league one players. So it's difficult to, it can be difficult to find the right ones, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Right. Okay. What's that? 12 minutes. Well done, guys. We've successfully managed to uh, talk about Sprouts and uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo for, for long enough. We're going to have to move on to uh, to Saturday's game, which took us to Ellen Road, um, the home of Leeds United, who were yet to lose at home. Um, they hadn't won their last couple of games, the, certainly the, the home game against Coventry, who were potentially slightly fortunate to uh, get away with the point the last time out which may have offered us some hope um, along with our own away form, which wasn't too shabby, certainly in terms of points and goals conceded. You know, we were pretty um, watertight at home. Uh, sorry, away. Um, so going into the game, this was our lineup, uh, the normal normal lineup. I suppose the only um, potential would have been, as ever, the right back and then again, that swapping of the centre halves, Joe. How does that look to you? Is anything any surprises, or were you happy with us going relatively strong for this with the games coming up? Um, I, I was surprised to see Tuanzebe in instead of Wolfenden. I, I expected it to be an unchanged team, but in this period when we've got these four games in nine days, I think there will be some more selections which probably catch the fans out a little bit more than, than they have done in recent weeks because. We don't know what their workloads are like, how how these guys get on, how fit they are, and there will be changes made which people won't see coming over the next few games. Yeah, anything there for you, Dave? And obviously, moving on to without knowing the result, you know, what sort of positions would you expect to be rotated in any case for the for the next game? <clears throat> yeah, I'd think I'd think Wolfenden will be back in for Twan Um Maybe, yeah, maybe potentially Williams. Williams in for Clark, I would have thought. Um, uh, yeah, Taylor, I would have perhaps thought in for Luongo next game. So, yeah, that's what I that's what I would see. And maybe, maybe another rotation with Broadhead potentially, but I'd yeah. certainly see those three, I think. Yeah, and Leeds themselves were as strong as they can be, I think, as well. Certainly from the, the front four perspective, um, albeit they had a... Some artillery on the on the bench as well. Um, they had some makeshift fullbacks, which again the guys in pre-match were hopeful that we may be able to take some advantage of. Um, Jed Spence playing out normally out of position on the left. Um, Arch Gray normally out of position right as as right back. Um, as it transpired, we didn't really get too close to have a chance to get too close to those guys, but. Dave, that's a that's a, a pretty strong lineup for a team sitting third in the championship, isn't it? Potent, 
I think, to describe it. And you know, I think word about the fullbacks. I mean, how well they played yesterday. He wouldn't have thought. Who, who would have thought? You know, after watching yesterday's game, that both Gray and Spence weren't full time <laughs> full time fullbacks. To be fair. They were very good. That crazy player, any flipping He's not even eighteen yet. Good grief, he could. You'd think he could go the whole way, but yeah, the strong and Padua again in midfield and Kamara and yeah, that, that front four is yeah, <laughs> yeah, too too good, isn't it? it? Really is. Yeah. Um. So yeah, the game started pretty breathlessly. Um. To be honest, the first five or six minutes, it was um two teams pressing very high and not giving either uh, either set of players much time on the ball. I think it was maybe the first five or six minutes until such time as Twan Zabi actually got his foot on the ball. I know Joe was talking about um, potentially playing Wolfenden in that relatively calm in possession role. And I say it did it for the first five, six minutes, nobody certainly in our team was getting much of a, um, a foot on the ball. Um, until Chaplin got fed it on the halfway line, Dave. Nice little ball into him on his, um, yeah, on his instep on the halfway line. I mean, that's, the, that's, that's his trademark, isn't it? That was a good ball. So that actually, Twan Zabi did. He, he Chaplin showed well for that, and it was a good ball from Twan Zabi driven in, just how Chaplin likes. It. And it's his trademark outside of the foot spin round the player, isn't he? And he did done him clear for. I think it was ironically, I think it was strike that uh, actually makes the challenge and goes. Clearly, it's clearly it's a foul. Um, oh, look, ref ref doesn't give it, and yeah, um, the move breaks up. It's fed to I think it's fed wide to Somerville and Clark covers well, but it's a corner. And yeah, I mean, yeah, irrespective of the Chaplin foul, this is poor, isn't it? It's really poor. I mean, it's a good corner, well driven in, but Crikey Piro's pre pretty much got a free header from six yards. As someone said on the Telegram group this morning, almost a Gordon Banks like save from um, save from Gladke, but unfortunately, unlike Banks, he doesn't sort of flick it over the bar, and it yeah, again, it goes straight to strike. Uh, ironically, goes straight to strike, who's what a yard out and just sort of nods it in. So it's a poor, poor goal to concede, really. And the, the, the last thing we wanted, you know, 36, 37,000 Leeds crowd. We know it's going to be intimidating. What do you do? We all spoke about it, right? First 15. And we've got this habit of conceding in the first 15. Keep it tight. Quiet in the crowd. Then you start to play and make your way into the game. And yeah, you're on the back foot straight away, aren't you? It's especially conceding a bad goal like that. But ironically, it should never, probably should never have been because it's a foul on the halfway line. Yeah, I don't think it was too too far after Sky had actually showed the the graphic of us being the most <laughs> prof, profligate, maybe uh, charitable team in the first fifteen minutes of games in terms yeah. of goals conceded, and lo and behold, it uh, happens. And Joe, I think uh, Kieran McKenna doesn't give away too much in his in his post match um, interviews, but you could see there was quite a lot of annoyance um, in him from not only conceding from a as early, but conceding, as he referenced the West Brom game as well, conceding from the opposition's first corner of the match as well. Yeah, and it was, it's just, that is the game plan out the window there, isn't it? Because the yeah. game plan is obviously to try and quieten the crowd, the crowd down and turn the crowd from a sort of 12th man to a millstone around the neck of the players. And we sort of turn them into a 12th man and a 13th man in the first 10, 15 minutes of the game. And yeah, frustrating. And I think, I know, you've got to defend the corner better, but when you don't get that free kick in the halfway line, it's such a big moment because that means that the game takes a pause to breathe, doesn't it? And then you move up there and then you're in a position to try and gain some territory up the pitch. And when you don't get that, and in these games, when you're playing away against sides of the quality of leads, you need all the little the little things to go in your way, don't you? If, if you're going to have a chance in these games and when things like that start going against you, then it's frustrating, but you've, you've got to defend the corner better. I think it looks like from one angle, sort of, I think it's Rutter maybe just sort of pushes Burns, shoves him just as he's about to try and sort of get the header above Peru as well. But it's all total wrong side for the ref. There's no way you can expect him to see it. But yeah, he sort of gets caught under the ball because he sort of gets shoved in the in the side. But yeah, you're, you're never ever going to get given that. Yeah, no. and we're we're clever at that ourselves, aren't we? In terms of our attacking mm -hmm. corners, you now we're we're pretty pretty good at the uh, blocking off the ball and making sure that people the the not the not the not obvious run is being blocked um, somewhere along the line sort of thing. So, yeah, a poor, a poor goal. And as the guys say there, it's uh, all of a sudden that a crowd which is already up for it is, uh, is even more even more whipped up. But saying that, things did calm down a little bit. Now, whether that's because 
we were getting more of a foothold in the game or whether that's because Leeds had sort of completed their initial task of the match and, and got the early goal and could then take a little bit of a breather and take the foot of the ball, who knows? Um, but yeah, so for the rest of the remaining quarter of, of the match, it's, I say things calmed down and things were starting to play out a little bit. Chaplin then got sided in half um, just outside their area, didn't he? By Ampadu, I think it was. Um, yeah. The referee played advantage, but there was no no yellow card um, resulting from that. That could have gone one way or the other in terms of having a, a free kick pulled back. Um, but then just a couple of minutes later, um, Joe Somerville has the run on Clark, but from from our possession? Yes, it's, we're sort of pushing our quite up on the high on the left-hand side, don't we? And look between Broadhead and Davis, they sort of get in a bit of a muddle over it and the ball is nicked away from Broadhead and then Davis tries to get there, but he just gets... They, they kept looking back to see if it was a foul, but it didn't look in any way no, a foul to me on Davis so. at all. No. And I don't think any Ipswich players appealed for it either. So it seemed a strange one that the commentators and the sky coverage seemed to focus on it. Just they... It was just a good bit of play. I think it was Gray, wasn't it? Just nicks the ball away from him and plays it. And then from that point, we are in big trouble. And you get there and Somerville's there. And Morsey's over there to give a bit of help. But very unlike Sam Morsey, he just sort of almost lets him walk past him, doesn't he? Maybe his wrong side. He's worried about getting that 10th yellow or whatever it is. But he doesn't really put any pressure on Somerville. And then it's just Somerville flying at Clark. And I don't think there's a defender in the league that can stop him in, in that position because he's just so quick and so tricky and so powerful and he puts the cross across and again it's one that whilst all that has happened we should defend it better it's not a particularly mm. great ball in there Burgess sort of dangles a lazy leg at it and then it hits Davis but even Davis I think I know it just hits him and goes in but I think he's got to be a little bit more alert to that doesn't he it's, it's not like it's it's not hitting from a yard away has it it, it just seemed like yeah they've they're going to tear you apart at times because of the player that Somerville is and the and the, the way they move the ball to him. But when it gets down to it, it's not like his veins running ice cold. He was putting a perfect ball in. We we had chances to defend that at that point, which we then failed to do. So I think there's yeah, a few disappointments in that goal. Yeah. And I say it's not as if, as you're saying about when the ball gets into the six-yard box, it's not as if Leeds had a lot of players and putting us under pressure in that six-yard box. They, they themselves are probably eight to ten yards away and it's, we, we'd actually set ourselves up quite nicely to defend that cross, hadn't we? The fact that Burgess, as you say, sort of dangles a leg and or half a leg and misses it. And then Davis probably has time to wreck, but probably wasn't expecting Burgess to miss it. And yeah, unfortunately, it, it drops in. And then poor old Davis, who's returning back to his, his former club, is, uh, has not had the, okay. the ideal start, Dave. Um, Again, I, I don't left. think you can underestimate Rutez part in that goal because that's the ball as they smuggle the ball out I think it goes to James and James just sort of knocks one into the halfway and Root is so good he holds off Tanzabi and knocks it off early first time and I think it might be Ampadu or maybe Kamara then knocks it first time as Somerville and then he's gone he's, if he's got a run on Clark or whatever he's gone hmm. and um, yeah it's not great defending but what he does do he puts a ball across the six yard box with pace and it comes in you know, it's not an airy fairy, just a roll ball across the box. Absolutely drives it in, and yeah, Davis as they both picked up on, he's just facing the facing the wrong way, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. But then um, a couple of minutes after that, or maybe a minute or so after that, you want to take us through a, a Chaplin effort, Dave, and, and through to through to half time. Yeah, this is superb, isn't it? I mean, this is chat. This is the Davis Chaplin combination, which we've seen so often this season. And yeah, we work the ball well. Davis gets the ball wide left, and again, you know, a, a measured ball in just outside the box. And it's great technique on his wrong foot as well from Chaplin, doesn't he? He, he hasn't got a lot of time mm. there. Controls it absolutely smashes a right foot half volley, and yeah, just you can just see it on the you know behind it on Sky, it just swerves away slightly and. You know, inside the Melier's not saving that. He, he's not even moving, is he? But just strikes the outside of the post, and you think then, yeah, maybe, maybe it's not, maybe it's not going to be our day. And then what? Again, this is disappointing. The goal just on half time. It's it's our throw, and it's a good throw again with deep Davis. You know, a good, really good long throw. And Burgess, Burgess up centre half. Um, wins the first ball really well, flicks in a really good area behind him in a six-yard box. No one's there. No one's anticipating. And it's just hacked clear. And again, this is Ruter, who's just... The, it's a bouncing ball. And I, I think we spoke about this before. Um, this is where perhaps Morsey 
<clears throat> with perhaps one mind on his on his sort of yellow card situation um, allows Routier to to get the better of him. So any other game and and, he, and he's not on nine yellow cards. I think he he takes him out there. He just he, mm. he, he you know just takes one for the team there. But he breaks and again as soon as it breaks to Somerville, his his pace is just ridiculous, isn't it? And poor old Davis. <laughs> Poor Ed Davis, to be fair, he's done well to get across and cover, but it's a clumsy challenge and it's no yeah, it's a penalty. Yeah, he doesn't he doesn't get the ball and he just sort of he really sort of slides and almost bundles into him, falls into him, doesn't he? And um yeah, it's a, it's a clear penalty. And look at two nil, okay, you're holding on, you don't yeah, yeah, two nil you've got a, a chance, you know, you get an early goal back in the second mm. half, you're in the game, but yeah, three nil and it's uh it's a clinic, you know. I don't think Clegg like, can be further away from a penalty. It's a, it's a really good penalty, isn't it? He goes left, and it's um, he had Clegg. He goes left, and he dispatches it in the top um, top right corner. Yeah, it's classy. Yeah, he didn't left roll it. He didn't right roll it in, did he? He didn't, didn't no, or other way around, whatever. But yeah, three nil, three nil down. It's, it's just a killer, and yeah, game's gone. Game's yeah, gone. Absolutely. Well, and and the thing is as well, what was what was evident from that first half, certainly to my eyes, was just the press, the Leeds press. They were just on us, weren't they? They were all over. So that, that one Chaplin um, chance was the only real, well, it was one of the only real chances. Broadhead had, had a proven. decent enough effort, didn't we? Work the sort of little situation. Just after Chaplin was fouled, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. After that, yeah. That, was, that, that was it. Yeah, we, we allowed the advantage. So that wasn't uh, you know, that far wide, but that was it. And yeah. unfortunately, that was it. <laughs> yeah, but I think that I think that those two shots were our two shots um, for it. the for the match. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but it was just the what, what was evident was this physicality, wasn't it, of the Leeds team? They were they were big, they were strong, they were quick, when they all over the pitch, and they were anticipating um, passes. And then when when we did have the ball, they were just they were on us all over us. And obviously, being two nil up and then three nil up, it the the atmosphere just um, gives them even Correct. more. Energy Frank, and no. adrenaline to, to, uh, it was, it was to carry similar, on. It was similar to the West Brom game, wasn't it? Where you, you let in that early goal and then you've, your game has to be perfect from that point on because they are just monsters off the ball at you. And maybe this is the difference between... like You've got to remember a lot of these players are League One players last season and they're doing fantastically this year. But when you're in those real, real tight spaces, you noted it yesterday during the game, Craig, that sort of Broadhead may be the only attacker with that real, real high technical ability when you've got mm. two players right on you all the time, when the pressure isn't just big pressure, it's massive pressure that you've got to be able to keep the ball and move it on to the guys when you're actually around, like George Hurst yeah. wasn't able to have the ball stick in, in that thing. Wes Burns, when he was had a bit of space, he was okay. But as soon as it got to a congested area, struggled. Connor Chaplin sort of drifted in and out of the game. And Massimo Luongo in the midfield, you didn't really notice him there. So Morsey was on his own in there. And it, we just, every, to, to win a game like that against a team like that with their tails up, everyone's got to be on their game. And you can't carry any, I wouldn't say passengers, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're passengers, but you, you can't carry any players that playing five, five or six out of ten. They've all got to be seven, eight out of ten. And there weren't any seven or eights out of ten yesterday, were there? Their no. midfield, midfield two were massive, weren't they? Just mm. Mm. That Ampadu's a player, isn't he? I've never really... But it is just the, the little things as well, like without sort of, it isn't an excuse, but if if Ampadu gets booked for that foul on Chaplin, which he should do, it affects right his the game. The game, it affects his game in the same way that Morsey's having to mm. not play at his full capacity because he doesn't want a two game suspension. And mm. it's these it's these little things. And, and for us to win there, you need all those little things, yep. or at least the, if there's 10 little things, you need eight of them to go your way. We probably had two of them go our way yesterday and like I say it's, it's not the difference between winning or losing it's the difference between us being in the game or not being in the game and yeah. give, giving us ourselves a chance which we may still have lost anyway and to be fair you know some of it's like, maybe not some of the home games some of the away games those little decisions have perhaps gone our way you know oh this certainly season. yeah we've, we've, we've certainly had it, more it, than it, enough yeah yeah it, it works itself out I guess yeah you say about the ball not sticking to Hurst, it, it didn't particularly yesterday, but then in the first minute of the second half, it did stick to him, but he gave the ball away and that leads to leads to Leeds hitting our crossbar you know, within the first minute of the second half. And yeah, again, just when you sort of, you know, as you said, Dave, the game is pretty much done and dusted, but you think, right, well, at least we can start the second half with a bit of momentum. We didn't even get the chance to do that because again, they've hit the crossbar within the first the first minute and then... 
five or six minutes oh, after that. Horrible, <laughs> this is a horrible goal, this one. <laughs> I mean, the, Burgess, who, uh, Burgess, you know, as we've seen, you know, uh, uh, where I sit at Portman Road, you know, the, the times I see Burgess play that ball to Davis and all, all this season, it's just been, you know, we've always commented, we've commented this season how Burgess' technique has improved and then nicely driven ball straight to his feet, you know, absolutely. But yeah, whether it's a bad ball, it is a bad ball. And whether Davis, who wasn't having the greatest game, is perhaps on his heels a bit. But it, you, you could look, maybe say it's great anticipation by Archie Gray, who so I think is just going to say going to be a superstar. Any, but you know, wins the ball, and and from then they're, then they're off. I think it's an interchange with James, and I think Ruter gets involved, and then I think it can't respond. I think they get to the ball edge of the box. They've got an overload with Somerville, I think, and um, they get a bit lucky here because I think Ruter tries to play the ball across actually to Somerville. And Clark just sort of like it hits Clark on the heel. I think he's he's going past him. And he sort of sticks out his leg, hits him on the heel, and finish. You know, just sits perfectly for Pira. Good finish, one touch, two touch, and just blast again. Lacking no chance with that from about eighteen yards. And you think at that stage, shit, fifty-one. What fifty-two minutes gone, um, boys? Let's not go for six or seven here because that was such was their dominance. But yeah, I think. Um, yeah, at, uh, I think at four, already at 4-0, there was talk from certainly the Telegram group, get Morsey off, get him off, get him off. So, um, yeah, and for once, um, not for once, um, yeah, um, that, that happened quite quite reasonably early on, what, 70th minute, I think. Yeah, that's right. I think that, that he'd, he'd had a couple of little challenges and nibbles and, yeah. you know, a, a little a thigh into someone to knock him over. And you think, crack, just, yeah, I think... Time he, rope. Yeah, he was he was very much treading that tightrope, wasn't he? And um, sixty-seven minutes it was. There were four subs made: Jackson for Hurst, Harness for Broadhead, Hutchison for Burns, and probably most importantly, Ball for Morsey. And that is very much Joe a case of a, that's a, a tacit implication that the the game is now up. We are wrapping these boys in cotton wool, ready for Boxing Day. Yeah, and. I think Morsey did one more foul, didn't he? Sort of a couple of minutes before he went off. And at this point, everyone was already screaming, look, you just got to get him off and move on to Leicester. And I think had he been booked in that period, I think it would have been a real poor piece of squad management for the for the um, winter period because the game was over. There was no need for it. The ref was sort of blowing up every time he went near someone almost, it seemed, at one point. Like, they weren't exactly... A couple of them didn't even look like fouls. He'd sort of pulled out of them and he went down and it's like, he's going to get booked here and it's and it's totally, totally avoidable. So just make sure you get him off. And McKenna did get him off and we sort of... We go again for Tuesday night at Leicester uh, versus Leicester. I mean, yeah. yeah, that was the only positive thing to come out of yesterday, really, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. But, and and, and that, was pretty, that, was, that was pretty much it for the rest of the match. They did... Again, they hit the crossbar. Um, Rutter hit the crossbar, didn't it? it? Deflected off Luongo and slammed against the crossbar uh, around about the 70th minute. But yeah, that is I mean, all she wrote. I think we barely got the ball in and around their box second half, did we? I don't think we did, barely. No, no. I so said, what, what there, as the guys again highlighted pre match, um, I think they had 49 goal contributions from their front four. Before the game, where well, you can add another th- add another three or four to that um, to that total after after Saturday. Um, so I will I will <clears throat> excuse me. I'll get up Rich's favourite chart, which is the momentum chart. Which very often um, <laughs> apologies for those watching. Uh, sorry, <laughs> listening on the pod, but it's very often I think it tells a, a story. Lot, a lot of blue, yeah. But there's <laughs> there's not an awful. Certainly that second half. Look, you talk about starting the second half well and um, maybe clawing a goal back that um that second half's a treat as is the first what quarter now 20 minutes it it really does show the um yeah the momentum of the i, th- I think the um when you look at the first half and as a whole mm. three nil didn't really sum up what the first half looked like did it they basically took every chance they had and were sort of just better than us in the key moments and that is a problem in a against quality and if you're not quite on it you can be three nil down but ultimately it, it wasn't a 3 0 game until that point, and obviously the game state then changes how the game went from there. That, that, like you play that game another ten times, you're not going to lose that four nil again. Probably are you? You're not going to have you're not going to have those issues, and not everyone's having an off day at the same time, and people get dragged about. It's just I don't know. It's just one of those one of those days. Good a, a good day to get a few mistakes out of the system in. Yeah, oh, you yeah. into the game as you pointed out earlier, Dave. Before we before we started, end of the game with. Not only zero shots on target, but zero corners as well, and a 
An XG what was, I didn't, point I didn't, 0.12, I think. I didn't see it. What was our XG? It point 0.12. Fingers in here. Okay. Mm. Yeah, so, <clears throat> as Joe says, maybe hopefully a uh, a day to have got everything out of our system and uh, yeah. yeah, refresh and take take your take your slap and and um and recover. I, I know the fans don't always have the same approach, but I think the players and the squad have very much got the same approach of we've lost the game, we draw a line under it, we start preparing for the next one, we move on to it. It doesn't really matter if it's 1-0 or 4-0. Once you, if you've lost, you've lost. It's zero points. We've got zero points. They've got three points. That was the worst that could happen. That has happened. We now move on to the next game. And as last two times we've lost this season, we then won four on the bounce straight after. So the club have been very good at compartmentalising a defeat, especially yeah. that West Brom one, because there was a big reaction to that West Brom defeat, which was of a similar vein to this, where we were just outclassed over the over the game and didn't lay a glove on them. They were they were easily able to shut that shut that off and move on. And yeah, we've got a much harder game to move on to next. Mm. But it's one of those games coming up Leicester where you think it's either we, and we won't know this until sort of 10 p.m. Tuesday night. They're either the perfect team to play because it's they might treat us a free hit and we get a good chance to get back on. And then if we win that game, you're doing well. Or it's the worst team to play because they're a quality side to come down and beat us and we lose <laughs> two on the bounce. But I don't know. It, it, it might turn out to be a, a really good game to be going into that one. You Sometimes the pressure if, if we were playing qpr next having lost mm. there there's so much pressure to then beat qpr mm. isn't there that it's like bloody hell we've got, we've got to go and beat these now after losing that last game but i, th- I think it'll work out okay yeah and as mckenna said afterwards you know as you as you guys say it's just one of those days you you learn from it you learn from the the goals you concede um yeah. you basically have to suck it up in the second <laughs> he basically said that didn't he and we just got had to suck it up in the second half we were going to lose you you'd go out there you suffer and it's all it's all now about the uh the reaction whether that reaction comes a boxing day as you say jay or whether that reaction comes in the the subsequent six months of the of the season we'll we'll find out won't we um and, and as a few guys were pointing out in the in the telegram groups um last night you, you don't get many successful seasons without being punched in the face a couple oh. of times um, throughout the course of it, um, and potentially that is arguably Leicester away in in the next month or so is is a hardest game of the season, done and dusted. You've now played Leeds twice, as Rich has pointed out a couple of times. Um, you know you 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 remember where we are, and uh, you get on with the rest of the season. Yeah. What we'll do, I, I, I'll just quickly get up the results from yesterday um, I don't th- and Friday. I don't think there's, there's too much to go through there. Not many surprises, I don't think, certainly from a, a late Plymouth goal um, situation. Um, Watford, I think, drew back a couple of late goals. Uh, but I say, yeah, there's there's not too much there. I think Sheffield Wednesday were looking on target to creep ever closer to getting out that bottom three, but Cardiff again had a couple of late ones themselves. Sunderland's probably the interesting one, guys, isn't it, in terms of mm-hmm. what's happened there in the last week and then the the subsequent um, loss yesterday to Coventry. I don't think the the natives are, are particularly happy up in the northeast at the moment. No, no, um, that's a that's a bad a bad start for Mick Beale, who's gone in there. There was talk of him not being a man, a lot of Sunderland fans wanted. Obviously, Tony Mowbray was happy there, but then there was talk of sort of Will Steele and managers that had done well on the continent coming in, and all of a sudden you've got a guy who's had less than half a good season at QPR, done okay at Rangers, but is sacked from there after not being able to compete with Celtic. But that was against Ange Postacoglu, Celtic, who were sort of one for the ages at the moment. But hmm. you come in you come in there and you're hoping to get a good start at home just before Christmas and you get turned over 3-0 in your first home game. And I, I think it's going to be a, a long battle to win some of those fans around. And you reference QPR there. They were at home yesterday to Southampton and you probably want to keep half an eye on uh, on our friends at Southampton because they're... Yeah, it, it does seem interesting how little has been spoke about Southampton, doesn't it? When they're like 16... It does just seem Leeds, Leeds... I think maybe because Leeds have such a dominant voice on social media, mm. mainstream media, because they are just the biggest fan base by a massive distance in this league, uh, that it's just... All you hear about is them. But I say Southampton, considering they lost... What, did they lose three on the bounce or four on the bounce? I can't remember. They lost at least three on the bounce, didn't they? And now they're, they've only lost four all season and they're seven points off us and 15 unbeaten. They're, they're, they're definitely on their way, aren't they? 
Yeah. yeah, I think it's fair to say we played them at a good uh, uh, up the, um, down there. We played them at a good the right time, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. But then you know, again, looking at that league table, there we are still seven points clear of both Leeds and Southampton. And courtesy of our good friend Chris Rand, he'd put together there this chart again. Apologies for those listening on our, on podcast, but um, what Chris has put together is a, a historic view of the last what, ten years um, from 2014 2015 season of the Championship. The points that various teams have accrued over the first half of that season, um, and there is only, to my eyes, one team that's got more go more points than us at this point in the season. That was Wolves in 2017, who went then went on to get promoted. But um, Leicester being very much an outlier at this point in the season. But it just goes to show there, doesn't it, to to both of you the point that this is and as Kieran McKenna was keen to understandably keen to point out after the match yesterday is we are still in a ridiculously good position um historically and also from from where we were this point last season to be in the position we are i think everyone just needs to just yeah take take the result take it on the chin and just look at the slightly bigger picture for the time being don't we yeah well if you look we play 23 games 52 points if we win 14 of our next 23 so sort of basically two out of every three games we'll get that just that alone without taking the draws into account takes us to 94 points. So we are in an incredible position and it is just a case of just, if you, if you win all the games, you should win in the second half of the season. So your sort of home games against bottom half teams, away games against the lower reach teams, you're probably six or seven points short of where you need to be. And you've just got, and if you can pick those up against top half teams away from home, top half teams at home, you're going to get over the line. So you just have to look at it sort of one game at a time. You see who's coming up. You try and get the win. You just try and keep the gap. Ultimately, it's not us versus Leeds or us versus Southampton in a playoff final tomorrow. It is they need to accumulate seven points more than us over half a season. So that's a lot of points for them to get as long as we don't just totally collapse, which I, I don't see us doing with the, with the squad we've got, with the manager we've got and the sort of the players who have done this before we're now in that stage of the season where we probably are got to be managing fitness for a few weeks to get us through to the other side of it and then hopefully can end the season obviously probably not with as many points as last year but on that sort of run where we just become relentless through the second half of the season that's what we'll be working towards now yeah, yeah. big <clears throat> as we said at the start excuse me <clears throat> big transfer window incoming very very big just to give that you know, the squad a little, uh, a little pep, a little refresh. I think. Um, I mean, Leicester's just unprecedented. I mean, we forget about Leicester. I know, but it's just unprecedented. I think I saw somewhere it's the best start any second tier club has had in seventy four year seasons or something yeah. like that. It's absolutely mad, isn't it? But yeah, if you think um, like um, Reading have got the second tier points record or the championship points record since yeah, look, the Premier League with one hundred and six points. Leicester are currently on track for one hundred and sixteen, ten more <laughs> points than that, and no one's ever even got close to that one hundred and six. I don't think anyone's got more like one hundred. No, I don't think so. So no, you're talking they're like twenty points ahead of probably the second best team in. Sort of ever, yeah. which is incredible, yeah. but yeah, it's it's nuts. But yeah, I think we we don't need to worry. Well, worry about them. Worry about them on Tuesday, but then then yeah. forget about them. Well, we, yeah, we just need to worry. We just need to worry about January. us, don't we? Yeah, just need yeah. to worry about us and get enough points from our games. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. and so thanks again, Chris, for for that uh, graphic. Hopefully, it's uh, a bit of a positive note for everyone um, who managed to get a look at it. And on that upward note, a little word from our sponsors. Innovation Labs is business hub and co-working space with strategic locations across Suffolk. Our aim is to foster innovation, entrepreneurship, business growth, and the development of an AI centre of excellence in Suffolk. Monthly hot desks are available from just £79. For more info, head to innovationlabsgroup.com or contact info at innovationlabsgroup.com. Innovation Labs, providing support for businesses across Suffolk. Locations in Stowmarket, Ipswich, Sudbury, Woodbridge, with more to follow. And um, just following on from that, I've got a few more plugs to do uh, in terms of Christmas shows, actually, because we, a bit like the Ipswich Town um, squad, we've got some rotation coming up, but we're, we're all over it in the next uh, week or so. Um, so following on from the Leicester match, uh, we have a Leicester reaction show on Wednesday. I know 
everyone loses complete track of what day is which, etc. So Wednesday the 27th is our Leicester Reaction and QPR preview show, 8 o'clock Wednesday night. Friday, which is the night of the QPR game, yeah, I think uh, we have a live reaction post-match on Friday after the QPR match. And then following New Year's Day, there is a reaction to the Stoke game on Tuesday the 2nd. So... I won't be te- I won't be testing everyone, but Wednesday the twenty seventh, eight p.m. Friday the 29th, post match. Tuesday the second, eight p.m. So we've got we're hopefully fully covered in t- in terms of reaction and pre match and reaction and reaction. So that's what we've got coming up in the next in the next week or so. Um, and obviously, on top of that, we've got all the interviews, etc., that uh, the guys have, have done between them. They're all on the on the YouTube and can be picked up on on the YouTube. Oh, they're all on YouTube and can be picked up on uh, the various podcast streams. Um, and also, we have uh, at least one winner to uh, announce. We had our uh, Metzala Designs Wes Burns print uh, was won by a gentleman Joe Perdot Perbrook. Sorry. Um, has won that and also we have a winner for the shirt giveaway um, which was uh, our promo for the last week or so Rich has advised me that he's just waiting to hear back from the winner of that but that will be announced the winner of that will be announced um, as a win but yeah thank you very much for everyone that entered and assisted um, us in getting our uh, subscriptions etc done and as ever please like and subscribe and all that funky stuff leave the reviews etc etc um Going on to questions, we had a mountain of questions coming in. I don't know whether people had been on the eggnog and were getting a li- getting a you know a bit uh, leery with the with the reactions to uh, to the match yesterday, but you know it, it, it was old school Blue Monday, um, you know, mailbag question time, and I've I've managed to hopefully um, compile them into some sort of logical. Um, categorization shall we say um there were some relating to the match there were some relating to transfer windows there were some relating to um, what happens to me now and the end of the season really so guys i will throw these out there um please forgive me if i don't manage to do it in turn because i'll i'll lose track of where i'm at but in terms of yesterday's match i know we've gone through it quite a lot actually but um just very very briefly jacob asked were there any changes in hindsight you'd have made joe i know you'd reference wolfenden but could we maybe have done with a, an extra body in the middle of midfield with maybe some Taylor legs in there? I think it's very difficult because we, we set ourselves up to play the way we do. And I don't think we're going to be able to flick a switch to sort of be like, actually leads a tough game. We need to set up more negatively because everything we do is geared around how we play. So I, I, I I don't think that extra body in the midfield is something that would even be considered, let alone done, because we then lose something in the attack. Right? Everything everything will fall down if one thing is moved out of place there. But obviously, you look at the performance, you're saying Luongo wasn't in the game, and it's like maybe Jack Taylor would have been better in there because a little bit more legs coming backwards. But I, I didn't see the team, and other than sort of wolfing them for acts, I'd, which... It's understandable. I didn't see that thing. Oh, I wouldn't have done this. We should have done this or that instead. I think it was just, this is how we were going to go out and we hope we get that extra bit of luck. We hope we quieten the crowd or we get the early goal and then it's a totally different game, isn't it? Yeah. Well, what a question that um, we had from both Matt and Nick, Dave, was about the tactics yesterday. Was it a tactical error by McKenna, Matt? asked was it the right or was it the right tactics not followed by the players? And then similarly, Nick asked, are our players capable of playing that brand of football against a Premier League standard team in effect well we, we spoke at the start didn't we? I think not many teams will go to Leeds and get try to go head to head like we did pretty much pretty much let's face it pretty much same formation four two three one um not many teams will go there and go there and try and pull that off and um because they've got better player, you know, no, no, no question. They've got Premier, you know, up against the Premier League, certainly front four, midfield, you know, right the way through the team. They've got better players than we have. So, yeah, but as, as Joe quite rightly said, that would have so knocked us off our, our sort of, um, our, our, you know, our usual, our usual game plan. That I'm not sure we're we're sort of capable of going any other way, really. Yeah, I, I, I get it that perhaps some legs from 
take the additional legs from Taylor in midfield, giving you a little bit more mobility in there. But yeah, oh, they would just totally nullify the way the way we play. So very much as we've said, look right the way through the thread, right the way through this podcast. You know, almost yesterday was a was a free hit. You've only lost you've lost three points. Um, yeah, there was fears certainly from me that we could have gone to six or seven or whatever at one stage. But you know, really, really move on from there. I think. And I think as well, uh, McKenna pointed out in his post match interview, we played this way at Southampton, we played this way at Middlesbrough, we played this way at Middlesbrough and Watford in the last week or two and come away with nine points from those three yeah. games. I think Leeds were, are a step above, aren't they, in terms of the personnel, as you point out there, Dave. And, and it's the narrative as well, the narrative of the game, you know, they're, they're supposedly, you know, they've been chased, they see us, they've got, you know, chasing us down. I was on a Leeds podcast in, in the week, um, LS1, I think it was, and... Um, Yesterday was their season, pretty much. You know, they're mm. building up to it. That's the vibe I was getting. They're absolutely their season. Oh, if we don't, if we don't beat you, I think that's what it'll be. You know, still ten, but that, that's our season done almost. So, um, yeah, the game was so hyped up. The narrative was so, so hyped up for that game that yeah, it was, it was always going to be a tough ask. No, what no matter what system we played yesterday. Yeah, I think and Neil Neil asked, and I think you alluded to it earlier, Joe. Was was you, yesterday the perfect time if not the opposition to throw in a, a poor performance and result and as I say it's just how we how we react to it isn't it really um james asks joe just to go on with that what's the biggest lesson or takeaway from the defeat um i guess you you just got to execute our plans better don't you i think that's the lesson but i think we we know that anyway you you, you can't give the ball away there and be caught in transition against these teams because they're, they're so quick. And But we are an all-or-nothing team. We play a high press, a, a high line, and that's just how we're going to be. But maybe it's a, it's indicative that maybe there is, an, if we could add a little bit more quality to the squad, which I'm sure we'll be desperately trying to do in the January transfer window, that'll help to push us forward a little bit. Yeah, yeah. And finally, just to draw a line at Cheeky Jim in our Telegram group, he asks, are Leeds a bang average Premier League side doing mediocre in the championship or a good championship team that haven't got as many points as us? Right, that will do for um, Leeds. I think we've uh, done that to death. So moving on, as you sort of spoke about there, Joe, in terms of um, January transfer windows, and as you said earlier, Dave, it's, it's looking even even more important now as as you look over your shoulder and see Southampton leads creeping a little bit closer. Um, and as we spoke about earlier about um, Stansfield, and as we, we found out post-match um, that Dane Scarlett is being recalled rather than sent back to Spurs. It's um, It's been reported that he's been recalled by Spurs due to the fact that they're going to be losing a few players in January themselves with the various competitions that are going on around the world. Mullets asked us, do we expect Stansfield to be an easy deal to do? And with Scarlett going back, do we expect Freddie to move now or in the summer? Which one of you guys wants to cover that? Yeah, I, I personally think Freddie will move now. He's just getting so few minutes at the moment, isn't he? And it just seems almost pointless in being here when you're still a player with sort of residual value that a League One team will be desperate to sign to get in to help them with their promotion push. He's, he's not he's not going to play a part for us this season. We've, we've seen that over the last five months. He's not deemed up to the, what is required, it seems, by Kieran McKenna and the management team. So you try and move him on. Dane Scarlet one, it's, it's frustrating because the whole loan seems to have been so badly managed by... Tottenham, so to speak, where they held on to him mm. all the way through pre-season. Played they him. then gave him a few minutes in the League Cup tie, which then meant when he came here, he then couldn't play in the League Cup ties. Mm. He then couldn't. He then went away for the international break, so he didn't get a chance to try and get his foot in the door. <laughs> so that cost him games. And now we're at a stage where in, what, two weeks' time, we're playing AFC Wimbledon in the FA Cup game, a game where he could start, and they're, they're going to pull him back and effectively they they just cost him any chance of getting a start here and yeah he hasn't he obviously hasn't been able to do enough to get into the league team but that's no great shame when you see the form of sort of broadhead hurst um chaplin even the sort of harnesses jackson's coming off the bench but where's burn started so it, it it was a tough role to get in but he's been done no favors in that so now it's a case of just trying to we it, we'll need to replace him straight away. Hopefully, Stansfield can be that player that we can get in straight away, or there's somebody else. A and other. There was talk with a Brendan Vasquez, but it seems like he's going to be well above our 
sort of station when you see the other teams linked there. I wonder in the way that Jay Stansford is one we've been in for in previous windows, if there's other players like that, one name that sort of jumps to mind is Colby Bishop, who we were in for in the summer, had a couple of bids rejected for him. Is that one we revisit? Yeah, he's probably going to be two or three million quid and it's a lot of money for a League One forward to step up. But if you were making a change and you're bringing on Colby Bishop or Freddie Ladapo, who would you prefer to see on there when you're trying to have somebody mirror the role of George Hurst? And mm. But ultimately, we, 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 nothing's going to come cheap for us this window. There's not going to be a million-pound player that no one knows about because we're a big swinging League One club who can do what we want to do and have a, and sort things out. We are now seen as a team on the brink of the Premier League and, and our negotiations will, I'm sure, <laughs> sort of take that into account. I suppose, Dave, that, that's the difficulty, isn't it, in terms of the recruitment and the type of player we look at. And it, this is no disrespect to, to Colby Bishop at all. But when we were recruiting in League One with a half an eye or more than half an eye on the championship, you go out and um, recruit Broadhead, Hurst, Luongo, Clark in January with a with pretty much knowing that they are able to make the step up should you be fortunate enough to do it. Now we find ourselves in a very similar position, albeit a league above. You're, you, what type of player, can, you know, realistically, are you able to buy a player or recruit a player that you can again use should you happen to be up in the Premier League? Or are you, in effect, throwing away... Two million again. I don't want to sound this disrespectful to someone like Colby. Let's say a player like Colby Bishop. As Joe said, you you give a club two million pound, three million pound for a player to hopefully make, assist you to make that step. But then next year, should you happen to make it, are they now the Freddie Ledapo of this year? If you see what I mean, who? who no, I, I think you're dead right. I think that's absolutely a really good observation. That's spot on. Really, yeah. You're really now. You're really now going to recruit someone to get you really to to give the squad the impetus to you know if it is someone like a colby bishop to effectively be a uh, a like for like for george hurst to and 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 then also hopefully maybe even stansfield as well to just get you over the line and then it's a, it's a totally different it's a totally different scenario once you get to you know once and if you get up it's totally different isn't it? you've just got to look again haven't you um you know if big if if we get up if we get up this season um yeah this time, you know, we'll be sitting here perhaps doing the Christmas pod this time next year. I think our, our first 11 and certainly our squad will have a totally different look about it. I, I guess you almost have to look as though there's a third league, isn't there? So when we signed, when we're in League One, we signed players who would be able to cut it in the Championship. Now we're in the Championship, we almost need to sign players who we think might be able to cut it as a top six Championship player. I know we are currently a top two Championship side, but you're signing players that you think can be top championship players because you just you just are not able to sign players who are Premier League players. Yeah. There's just no way you can sign those at this stage. So you're signing players that you hope, if you don't go up this year, are still good enough to be yeah. top six championship players next year who, might, who, when you come to sell, they might be able to be sold to a parachute payment relegated team. I guess that's the sort of height of, well, not the height of your ambitions, but probably the height of the Absolutely. realistic ambition that you can have this window. Players that could, it's like, are these players able to be, like Jay Stansfield is probably one who you think, yeah, he could be a top six championship player. He looks like he's got the sort of bits to do that. But is he a Premier League player? Well, if he was a Premier League player, Fulham wouldn't even be countenance and selling him for a sort of fee that we could afford. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. And that sort of um, links into a question we had from Tom about, with Scarlett being recalled, do we now need two attacking players? I think I think we probably probably do uh, because we already thought we we may need one in in any case. Um, yep. Ed Ed asks, do we need and probably on the back of of yesterday, do we need a little bit more dynamism or pace in our in our midfield centre midfield? Um, it's interesting, as I said earlier about Luongo Dave staying now for for January. Whether that does. Um, alleviate the the sudden urge to need another centre midfielder or does a performance like yesterday highlight that we might need some legs given the the relative ages of the guys in there yeah that's a good point i don't i don't necessarily think so i think you know you won't come up well we won't come up against a midfield too i don't think quite like it although you've got harry winks on <laughs> coming up on uh, coming up on tuesday and, and whoever but um uh 
no, I, I think, um, I th uh, yeah, I, th I think we're fairly well, fairly well served in that position. And I think, well, Don Ball came on for Morsey yesterday, a little very rare cameo for Don Ball yesterday. Um, and against teams perhaps not of the Southampton, not of the Leicester or Leeds ilk, you know, he could probably... Yeah, someone like him can probably come in and do a job. And certainly, certainly, I think Jack Taylor. Jack Taylor again has had little cameos. I mean, we know we know all about his his, his goal scoring attributes and stuff like that. But I think, you know, as as, as time goes on, he's going to obviously, you know, more experience of being in and in and around the team. And I'm sure he'll get, yeah, he'll get a lot of um, he'll get a lot of in game play be between now and the end of the season. And I think he could step up quite easily. Yeah. Just interesting enough, they do just get another and just another as you say, ball play just they don't got his booking and yeah. whether they whether they ride it out or whether they as Joe says, you know, there, there would have been as in relation to Stansfield, um, there will be names that would have been after previously. It's just whether they're still on our radar now. We've made a little bit of a, an edge up um, yeah. through the leagues and probably ahead of expectations where we where we hoped we would be. Um, whether those those um players have you know, dropped off our radar a little bit. Yeah. So th th thanks to those guys for those questions. Thanks to Adam and Neil who had very similar um, questions um, in terms of transfers and bits of pieces. As you can probably understand, people are very much asking questions along the same lines about attacking areas and centre midfield areas um, and whether yesterday's match stroke performance um, would alter those in any way. I can't really um, imagine that it that it would have. Um, moving on to Boxing Day, Paul asks if you can see any tactical changes for Leicester. Is there an argument for a deeper midfielder to combat their potency on the break, Joe? I don't, I don't think there'll be any tactical changes there. Might be some slight tweaks in there, but I, I don't see any any major changes for it. No, no, not at home. No, no. You might, you might just you might just play a little bit deeper, maybe have a lesser high line and maybe not quite as high a press. But you're not you're not going to be doing anything fundamentally different because ultimately what we've done has earned us 52 points from 23 games, and we're going <laughs> to. We, we can't move, we can't move away from that, can we? And I think it's when you because you look to get teams when they go to the Premier League, someone like Burnley, for example, and they've kept doing what they want to do, and yeah, they've had some ch sort of chastening days like we had yesterday. But ultimately, they, they need to get better at what they want to do, so that when they do have the games against teams of a similar standard, they can then beat them, which is what happened to them yesterday when they went mm. away to Fulham to win. And yeah, they they might go down, but I don't think you can just fundamentally change the way you want your team to play just because you're playing better teams you just need to try and do it better yeah no absolutely. especially being at home you know we we've we're attacking we're attacking away from home but we're attacking at home aren't we it's what we do it's what's brought us the amount of points the amount of goals both for and against um so far this this season so yeah as Jess, um, i think there'll be tweaks rather than a, an actual um, and, and with change. the lead Leicester have got in the table they they put their strongest team out yes they beat Rotherham 3-0 they could easily just say look we're going to we're going to make eight changes for the game on Tuesday because we're we're so far ahead we see we'd rather just rest the squad till the 29th game and do that that they've they've earned the right to be able to do something like that and if they do fair play and thank you <laughs> Are you saying they'd, they'd rather us go up with them than Leeds? I don't think it's about who they want to go up. I oh, think I it's more just the way the fixtures are falling. Yeah, of course. Yeah. They just need... You, you can't sort of try and be too clever and be like, oh, we'll, we'll rest players against Rotherham. Because then if you lose that one, then you, you then put loads of pressure on this game. Where now, th we talk about us, oh, it's a free hit for us. It's the biggest free hit going for Leicester, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, they'll probably draft in Vardy and Ian Nacho or something. Um, qu question from from Jamie here is: Given, in his opinion, every player is performing above and beyond their ceiling to get us where we f currently find ourselves, do you think, Dave, that where the team currently finds itself is sustainable with the current squad? Yeah, it's a very good question. There was another question. I think well, this might well come up about um, you know, obviously playing the second second stream of games against you know teams and teams perhaps wising wising up against is i think we've said you know yeah i think the squad the squad needs needs a lift any yeah you know, any new players any 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 new you know transfers you know and they're going to be players of a reasonable we know you'd think a reasonable championship or higher end championship stature so that's just going to give the squad going to give the whole squad a lift and the whole a, a, a place to lift not that we necessarily need it's an odd one it's not necessarily need it look we lost four nil to let's face it a, a very 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 good you know a very 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 good side so yeah it's it's a difficult one but you know any any new transfers coming in are just going to give the squad and the whole and, and the place uh hopefully the boost not lift the boost to um 
to carry us through, as Joe said, you know, with those, what, 14 wins, is it? Yeah, carry us through to achieve what we need to. Yeah, well, as Mark's talking about the number of wins, etc. Mark asks, that, will we win 16 of our next 23 <laughs> league games? If not, how many do you predict us to win? But as you said, Joe, you know, it's it's a question of seeing, trying to win the ones that you should you should be winning, yeah. picking a draw up where you can and seeing where you find yourself, isn't it? But even if you think, bearing in mind we've lost, what, three games in 23, if we were to win 13, draw five, lose five, which is a significantly worse record than what we've had in the first half of the season, that takes us to 96 points. It's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> so we're in, we're in it's such an incredible position and mm. chances like this won't, won't come around again. Like I'm not saying we'll never get promoted, but th- we are never going to be in a stronger position going into the second half of the season as we are now because no team other than Leicester has done in the last 20 years. So it's such a big opportunity for the club to really go for it. And I've got no doubt that McKenna will be imploring that on Ashton and that zero doubt that Ashton will be putting that onto the owners. And the owners know that cool, we are so far ahead of schedule. And even if you can go up for yeah. one season and come back down, what that will do to mm. the club, the town and everything around it will just yeah, okay. give you such a lift and such a boost and make, make all their long-term planning so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite interesting because Chris Rand again, he asked the question, is it possible for a team to be outclassed by the half dozen teams on parachute money, yet be so consistent and dominant in the other 75% of matches that they get enough points to make automatic promotion regardless? And I think that's where we find ourselves, Dave, isn't it? Absolutely. Flat, flat, what they call the flat track bullies, don't they call them cricket? Is that that the the term, I think? Not can we be the, yeah, can we be the Graham, the Graham yeah. Hick of the championship? Yeah. <laughs> the Graham Hick, love that. I mean, and not come across too many Murph Hugheses. <laughs> his, yeah, yeah, his kryptonite, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, don't forget, as we said earlier, we've been to Southampton, um, played them at the right time, got three points there. So, you know, um, uh, we've got two more games against Leicester starting Tuesday, one against... Um, one against Southampton. Look, and there's, look, there's going to be tough games. There's going to be tough games along the way. Um, hey, you know, the one up the A140 in April. Look, we all local derby. We know that's going to be. You know, we all know what it was like last weekend. That's going to be. That's going to be a toughie. And and others are going to be pushing. You know, pushing up towards the. You know, pushing up towards the playoffs. So, um, yeah, as Joe said, the points in the bag. When when you when you when you consider the points that we've got in the bag, and you know the the drop the you know drop off we can be we can allow. To, to a Kruger 94, 95 points that we think will we'll get us there. Um, it's just looking so good, isn't it? It really is. So I think we've got to very much, you know, very much be so positive still. Uh, and finally, a couple of questions here from uh, Carl and Mark, which I'll, I'll link together is, Carl asks, do you feel teams have started to work out our system and should we make a change to it for the second half of the system? And Mark asks... What are the biggest improvements to make from the first half going into the into Ooh. the second half? <laughs> Can't show you. <laughs> um, I don't. Th- I don't think we'll be making changes to the system. The system works, doesn't it? Works better than any other system I've seen Ipswich Town play with for the other thirty odd years I've been coming to the club. So no, and the tweaks. I, I guess one. I guess one of the only tweaks would be the the type of player in the roles. Maybe sort of like a Connor Chaplin. Maybe you have somebody who's more gets up and down the pitch a bit more than the Connor Chaplin, but I don't think for a second you'll be dropping him out. Maybe someone, I don't know, maybe you go a little bit more orthodox with the sort of centre-back and don't push the right-back on so much from there. But And I guess it's just the makeup of the central midfield pairing is the only thing there. Mm. I guess the plan would be would have been previously for Jack Taylor to sort of take over from Massimo Luongo, which changes things slightly, but I don't I don't see that particularly happening this season now with the way Luongo's been. So, yeah, I, I think it'll only be sort of personnel and, and the the different styles that that personnel has, if that makes sense, as opposed to ripping the system up. So someone like maybe if in games later in the year, you might take a Nathan Broadhead out and put a Marcus Harness in because he is just a better off the ball player than Broadhead is obviously a much superior on the ball player. But it might be actually when we'd want to play games where we think they're going to be tougher games, you might maybe make a change like that to try and going to be ne- neutralise them a little bit more as opposed to go out and try and necessarily outscore them. Yeah, you're right. It's going to be personnel tweaks rather than tactical tweaks. You know, tactically, it's got its 52 points from 23 games. Well, you know, if it ain't broke, you're not, you know, don't fix it. 
and I, and I think if there are any tactical changes, they'll be so imperceptible to our layman's eyes, won't they? That um, they'll be they'll be happening, but not. Sean, Sean will um, Sean will keep us posted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. and, and also th these things do happen quite gradually as well though so it might be that something is changing slowly and it and when you look at the team in 10 games from now to 10 games previously yeah. something has changed but it's just been a gradual change which has just worked its way around yeah absolutely well thank you very much for that apologies to to those of you who i haven't managed to get around to the question as you, as you can probably understand there were there were a few that were along similar lines but hopefully we've we've covered off the the majority of them but i say again thanks very much for for sending them through and you know congratulations to the royal mail for getting them to us in time this this time of year um one last one from romeo what are the blue monday boys hoping for from father christmas this year joe do you want to go first um, don't, don't say three it. points on Boxing Day, please. That doesn't count. No, but if if somebody could find me one of the two bird shirts from the last twenty five years, that I haven't managed to get hold of and put one of those through my chimney. That would be, that would be great. But they <laughs> they seem they seem rarer than elves' poo at the moment. So <laughs> what was that? What shirt was it? Um, it's the red and black one from the ninety two ninety three season. The black Ooh. awakening Berg, or Berg, or the Blackburn Rovers. Yeah, that one. Milton. And then the black one we wore at range is a TXU Energy one, that oh, one, that's... and then a and then a red one, which we were supposed to wear against Coventry in the Premier League, but we didn't actually wear in the end. So I'm not too worried about that, but Green King one. But if either of those three want to find their way to my doorstep, <laughs> then I will be very, very grateful. Yeah, just Star Wars Lego for me, really. All oh, right, well, the the Millennium Falcon. Yeah, the, the, the um, sort of the one I saw. The one I saw, I took little Rosie to Smith's the other day. This there for like it's like six hundred pounds. I, I did have to look twice. I did have to look twice. I must admit. Yeah, yeah, and the rest I think some of them didn't they? When when you step up through the uh, levels, uh, you're looking at uh, yeah, I, the I, end I of think a thousand so. pounds or some Lego. Uh, yeah, absolutely. By the way, did you see that thing about Darren Ambrose and his Lego collection? I saw I the headline. Oh, so, do you see it, Joe? Yeah, that he's. I, I I know he's a Lego builder. He's got like a Lego Instagram account. I can't really yeah, no, talk. Got like like... here, not quite on camera. I've probably got about two and a half thousand pounds worth of Lego there. To oh, be fair, here so. we go. <laughs> I forgot Joe was a Lego. Yeah, Darren Ambrose. Yeah, incredible. Him and his, they've actually got a. Um, yeah, actually got a sort of like. I think they do a vlog on it and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. The the Darren Ambrose Lego Seven or something like that. He's got like five. <laughs> Five kids, hasn't he, and stuff. Mm. Yeah, incredible stuff. Bloody hell, Lego. If he'd have found that Lego a few years ago, he might not have had so many. <laughs> Legos, barber shops. He's got his finger in a lot of, lot of pies, isn't he? Isn't that <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. Well, wonderful stuff. Well, I think that will pretty much do us. I think we've gone above and beyond the, on, on again on Christmas Eve. It's Christmas Eve morning. There's there's wrapping to do. Joe's got to start boiling his sprouts ready for uh, their twelve hour stint in the in the pot before he can. Um, Get, get that the... recipe out there, Joe. Get that yeah. sprout gratin recipe. We need to see it. Any Christmas messages from you guys before I click the button? Just hopefully 2024 can be as good as 2023 has been. <laughs> what what a fantastic year supporting Ipswich Town it's been. Yeah, it absolutely. Ditto that. Absolutely incredible. If 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 24 can be it's like half as good, yeah, yeah. Almost as good as 23 there. We're in for an exciting ride. Wonderful. Well, thank you very much, guys. Thank you, everyone who's who's watched or listened to us uh, today and over the the previous uh, weeks and months of, of this year. Um, have everyone have a fantastic Christmas. Have a couple of days not worrying or thinking about football if you can. Um, enjoy your time with your your family and friends. Merry Christmas from everyone at the Blue Monday podcast. Mm -hmm.